All right. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone here today. Um, you are um, here amongst um, three hawks and a robin. So it's a very birdy uh, little congregation amongst you today. And, um, but I want to say uh, that um, the three of them really have a dove personality in their hearts, and you will discover that uh, during, during our talk today. So um, I'm trying to read this. Uh, as modern people do on their phone. Um, anyway, uh, they, uh, I've, I've known Glenn Hawks for decades now, and uh, we got to know each other mainly um, during the time of President Reagan becoming the president and talking about, well, let's bomb we can bomb Russia in five minutes uh, if we we can begin bombing Russia. He actually made that joke, uh, which is okay. It's a joke, but why make a joke like that in the middle, midst of the arms race increasing so much? So the arms race was definitely uh, heating up at that time, in 1980 and 82, and so on. But the peace movement was also. Uh, heating up, and that's where we worked together in Montpelier, in Burlington. Uh, Glenn was active in central Vermont, Students for Social Responsibility, and he organized the 1995 International Teachers for Peace Conference at Norwich University. Um, and we both attended and uh, were inspired by the gigantic demonstration in New York City in 1982. Did uh, others here, did you go to that? Okay, good. You get a, you get oh, wait, a medal. Oh, he went. He said he went. Yes. I you were there. there too? I was there. Was yeah, there. all right, wonderful. And yeah. um, that Sunday was the march and Monday was a UN protest. <clears throat> so yeah. we were in there. <laughs> And uh, a lot of people were arrested. A thousand people were arrested. That, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. that was sort of the, the, the beginning, or maybe it was a high point of the peace movement, because we would not be able to muster, I think, at this point, that many people in New York City um, on, on the issue of nuclear weapons and peace yet. But I'm, I'm hoping that, that will, we will be growing. Um, so, um, so anyway, I followed the, the careers of, of Glenn's two sons, and I thought it would be wonderful to bring all <coughs> three of them together. Um, the, the three life, different life works that they have all been involved in. Um, Jesse organized Theater for Social Change in Rwanda, and is a former head of Global Youth Connect. And Elijah was a principal of Randolph High School and mm -hmm. had written several books. One of them, School for the Age of Upheaval, that's now, of course. And the second one is, Woke is Not Enough. Hmm. <laughs> what does he mean by that? Yeah, Maybe that. he will tell us. <clears throat> uh, but at the moment, uh, Glenn is going to start us off here. Is that right? No. no. We said he can't start us off. I can't. Oh, okay. I can't. You yeah, just I... never know where he'll take us. So we're kicking it back to Jesse to start us off. Oh, okay. Oh, Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Robin, for having yeah. 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 I just want to say that Robin Lloyd and her family go back to 1915 and before the formation of the Wilf organization, I think the oldest active peace and justice organization, possibly, if anywhere. And Robin has been an inspiration, her family. Uh, I also want to... Uh, the 1995 International Congress for Teachers for Peace was held at Norwich University, and it wouldn't have been held except for my friend Nat Frothingham sitting back there. There's Nat. He is the founder and first editor of The Bridge, uh, the newspaper, the local newspaper that's still active in Montpelier. 
And that did a lot of things, including he helped us pull us, pull us out of a hole, a, fin a financial hole that we had gone into on the, uh, on the, on the conference. Uh, I want to thank also my ex, who is here. And these boys wouldn't be here without Kristen. And Kristen, uh, even at, early in our marriage, that didn't last all that long, but early in our marriage, she did a lot of work and she was going to school, uh, bringing in some, some income for us. And uh, I was able to stay home at that time. And I'll tell you how, what that meant to me the short time I was home. And Tom Dean is here. Tom is the inspiration and force behind a program that started at Harwood Union High School. And Tom will say a few words about that later. There yeah. will be a chance for um, yeah. interaction with yeah. all of you. Yeah, so my son is telling me to stop now. <laughs> I, also, I also met Nancy Rice. I remember her on our mailing list. I'm not doing a very good job. Yeah, OK. There are lots of yeah. relationships and lots of good debts in this room. <laughs> Lots that we. <clears throat> Would you like to do a go around right now just to know who's in. S sorry, say again. People should give their name? Yeah, I think we're a small enough group. We should, we should do that. Say your name and one other thing about you, perhaps, and we could start with you, sir. Uh, I'm uh, Jerome uh, Lipani, and uh, I'm a videographer, uh, especially of movement uh, events. And uh, I have a channel on Orca, uh, and it's Jerome Lipani, YouTube, if you'd like to see my work. Uh, so, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Virginia Pat, I'm a WILF member. I live in Boston, Massachusetts. Hmm. I'm Max, and I'm a WILF member as well, and I'm I'm Chelsea, I live in Rochester. I have a four-year-old daughter, so I'm hoping to raise her to be a <laughs> Nancy Rice from Randolph Center, and um, I'm a member of WILF and Vermont Yankee Recognition <coughs> Alliance um, and Randolph Area Peace and Justice Our, Coalition. It is the uh, project, is the camera able to hear these people, or should we turn the mic? Could someone add to a person? I think we can, mic, under, we can, can no, no, leave the mic, please. Thank you. I, I got it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I've already been introduced. I'm Tom Dean. I taught at Harwood Union High School for 38 years, and through the efforts of the Hawks family, got to take students from the initial adventure, as it were, to uh, Rwanda. Hmm. Ooh. Oh. Cynthia Jackson, Randolph, Vermont. I taught at Randolph Union High School quite a while before you. <laughs> Kristen Reedy, I'm the mother of Elijah and Jesse. Uh, I live in Moortown. And um, I'm retired now, but I've been a special educator my whole professional life. Hmm. I'm Dorothy Robson, and my husband Dick and I founded the White River Valley Players Community Theater Group 45 years ago, <coughs> and we're still involved. <laughs> I'm Matt Carlin, and it's a thrill to be here. I'm just taking in, it's wonderful, wonderful. How did you pull this together? I can't even get the mail delivered over where we live. <laughs> well, this is such a beautiful space to have events happen, and uh, I have a foot in uh, Rochester, so I prevailed on getting hold of it. You folks want to? Uh, first word, I live off of Hancock. And Jennifer of Hancock. I'm Dr. Island of Jason Horowitz. I think I might have been at that march in New York City in the 80s, even though I was barely a teenager with my hand rock. Huh. <laughs> uh, John Moody from West Hartford. David Marmer from here. Sandy Hawes from Rochester. Lynn Rogers from Thetford. Duncan Nichols from Thetford. And Nancy Rice and Rob and Lloyd and I have a petition that's going to Becca Ballant, which is to ask her to co-sign uh, HR 77, which is to abolish nuclear weapons, 
So uh, there's a bill up right now. And so if I don't have your email in this room, give me your email if you want that petition. I'll send it to you. <coughs> Just press the button and back will we'll get your name. And do you have the clipboard or do we have a clipboard here? Well, just come to me. I have paper and pen. Oh, okay. If you oh. like the petition, we're trying to get this month enough signatures so that she pays attention. So you're collecting emails, It's a good emails, bill. Right? It's got 45 other co-signers in the house. You're collecting people's names and emails. Just your, so. yeah, yeah, send me your email. Give me your email today if you mm -hmm. would like me to send you the petition. Okay. Good. Thanks. All right. All right. Well, I'm Elijah Hawks. It's nice to be with you all. And your name is? Jesse Hawks. Nice to be with everybody. And we're going we're gonna to start things off with a little window into some of the work that has happened over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, just a glimpse, and then we'll circle back to it a bit later. So, Jess? And if, if uh, the writing may be too small on the board, I'll try to speak it out, whatever's being said, OK? It's uh, sung in Kinyarwanda, but there should be some English subtitles. Anti Sida fighting AIDS. We 
will return to that story a little bit later in our reflections. <clears throat> This is a meal ready to eat. I pulled it out of my basement this morning. I think when my son Lucius was one year old or less, a few months old, I would walk around with him a lot and sing him to sleep. And then once he was asleep, I might actually just pull out a book and read while I walked around with him in, uh, in, in the, whatever it was called, Baby Bjorn maybe it was called. And I was reading at the time books about uh, climate change and the coming climate crisis. And in addition to singing my son to sleep and reading these books, I would lose sleep myself and I would think, well, what can I do when the world falls apart? And I ordered a box of MREs. These are meals ready to eat from the U.S. Army surplus. My fears about the coming crisis motivated me, I don't know, to do something I think probably rather silly. To think that if I, if I put a few meals ready to eat in my basement and maybe, I don't know, put some, enough plywood down there to, to batten down the, the windows that when it all goes down, I'll be ready for at least a couple of days to maybe feed my family in the face of whatever fear is motivating me. And I, I, I mentioned that this morning because one of the themes of the conversation that Jesse and my dad and I have been having as we think about some of the ways that our work has intertwined over the last decades and how it has intersected with the, the, the work and thoughts and lives of people like you in this room. One of the things that we, I think, are wrestling with, and we decided it would be a theme for our conversation today, is acknowledging that fear and stories of war and theories of competition and fear of the other concern about the invader, these are very motivating stories, very powerful stories, and easily motivate many people. Fear of the other, fear of the, of the danger, the desire, the need to conquer, to protect, to build a wall, to keep out what threatens us. These are very powerful stories. And a companion question to acknowledging that is, how do we tell and embody stories that move us toward love and compassion and solidarity. Given how powerful these other stories are, how can we tell and embody other kinds of stories that motivate us perhaps less to build a wall and more to build solidarity with others? So how do we tell those stories is one of the things we've been talking about. And with that, I'll um, invite my dad to talk about some of the symbols and stories that you were thinking about and um, in company with others when Jesse and I were just <clears throat> little boys. That's right, when you were little guys. And uh, I'd come in my life to believe that stories are what human beings have in order to have culture, civilization, and the good and the bad all together. And it struck me as Elijah was speaking that each of us in this room is a story, or probably a compilation of different stories. We put the stories on ourselves at different times. I, I taught st students in high school that we are, we exist, and we become as we story ourselves being and becoming. It's a simple proposition. I believe it's true. And the stories that I feared a lot in 1980, 79, 80, through that period, were about my family, my wife and two children, especially these little ones that I had a chance to put on my shoulder. What would I do? One thing about being a parent, and why I think the question about the children was so important is that as a parent, I thought I would do something that I think most everyone in this room would do who has cared for children, whether they're their own children or other little children, which is if 
One of my children were on a railroad track, and a freight train was coming. I would give my life for that child. Until I had children, I never wanted to give my life for anything. <laughs> I, I heard a lot about going into the military and giving your life for this, the highest honor. I think the highest honor is caring and being willing to sacrifice for one's own children. At that time, the United States government, believe it or not, it's hard to believe, was talking about waging and winning a nuclear war. And uh, I had done a little bit of study of what would happen if there was a nuclear war. And uh, as I do many times, I borrow ideas from others. The city council in Cambridge, Massachusetts, had passed a resolution for being in favor of a nuclear freeze. And behind that resolution, there were a number of doctors, physicians, as members of the Physicians for Social Responsibility that I turned to in order to get information of what would happen to children, what would happen to people, but especially to the children if a war took place with nuclear weapons. And at the same time, Robin, I don't know if you were one of those, some of people living in Vermont who had nice houses were being chosen to host families from Connecticut and other places where there's more of an urban center to host them in the event of a nuclear war. Absolutely. Yeah, not just big houses, small houses. Everyone was being asked to accommodate more people and it was being laid out who would come where if there was a nuclear war. So this was civil defense planning, I think it was called. Yes, that's right. And I heard Senator Leahy one time talk about what he knew of the civil defense planning, and it was so silly. Uh, we were having people from New York City leave the city uh, by automobile, and if your automobile plate began with a certain number, you'd leave one day when a nuclear war is coming. And if your automobile number plate was a different number, you'd leave the second day. Of course, you'd wait wouldn't you, when a nuclear missile was coming. So the foolishness of it all. They asked people to leave food for the cat uh, at the same time. I felt that stories needed to be told that were better stories than what about the Russians. What about the Russians was the rationale for the buildup. We got to stop. No, think of what the Russians would do. What they were doing was called a mirror image. What about the Americans? So I sought to tell a story in this booklet, helped by many, many other people with many drafts, 16 pages. It took me longer to put this together than my doctoral dissertation at Harvard, and that's the truth. It took longer because I spent more time on every word. I wanted parents, especially, and teachers to pick this thing up and to say to themselves, my God, this is the kind of thing that would happen. In Vermont, of course, there probably were no direct targets, but Plattsburgh, New York, was a special base for the big bombers, and Plattsburgh, the winds from Plattsburgh come across Lake Champlain, and they would have come into our area. I remember one doctor, I won't give his name, he's still here in Vermont, and at one of our meetings, because of all the talk of waging and winning a nuclear war, this doctor took morphine, he hid it away in his bathroom because he couldn't bear the idea that his children would suffer in the aftermath of a nuclear strike. And in this booklet that was translated in many different languages, we have the German here, and uh, Spanish, and it, was, it wasn't in the millions, but probably in uh, 400,000 copies in the United States, mailed out to people asking for a donation, not requiring money, but asking. And a lot of good people uh, did send. And Nancy Rice, she was on our mailing list, and I remember her, <laughs> Nancy. 
yeah, I won't say how many donations you gave us, but you did, yeah. Some people I kept writing back to, like Robin. What about the children? Wave a small flag. Yeah, what about the children? And wave a small flag. This is the small flag. Wave it, wave it, wave it. When the, when the, when the patriotic band comes by, wave this flag. Actually, Dad, this is actually, I think, one of Jesse's infant shirts. I, I never could, you never knew where me, I could find one. I kept, kept it, but this, is, this was Jesse's. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Thank you, hon. You, yeah. you, you, you take that back and hold on to it. All right. I don't want to ruin anybody's day here today, but I understand from knowledgeable sources about the secondary targeting, in other words, if the missiles that are coming over the top of the pole are running out of steam and aren't going to make it down the eastern seaboard, that Burlington and Hammer and Hampshire are both secondary targets. Burlington, because of the minigun plant, was GE. I don't even know who it is now. Thank you for that. Thank you for that information. Well, that's <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's so unfortunate. We began with telling this story and getting out into the community uh, on the morning of the nuclear freeze resolution in Vermont. Many, many towns passed the resolution. Did I already speak about this booklet? This you booklet Cambridge. Is, a direct, is, is a direct copy, with the language changed pretty much, of what the uh, physicians and the city council did in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I, found, I went down there, I got a copy of this booklet, I said, we'll make one for Vermont, and we handed it out when people came into the meetings on that morning. Eventually, one of the people working with me came and said, do I mention now? Yes. One of the, I'm trying to get things straight. One of our members came, a woman named Janet Hubbard Brown. She still maybe lives in this area, written a lot of books. She said, I want to write a play for children. And she and I said, we went, we went back and forth. I said, if we get children involved, people will say you're using the kids. You're using them, you're planning these ideas, and so on. So I can't listen to you. And I resisted, but I failed. <laughs> and Janet Hubbard Brown wrote a musical called Heart of the Mountain, Heart of the Mountain. And that musical made its way to uh, many places, including Germany and, and the Soviet Union at that time and different places in Vermont and around America. So, so this is where Jesse, Jesse jumps in to, uh, to tell a bit of this, this story about the intersection of mm -hmm. education, uh, social justice, seeking peace and the arts, and where it took him and dad and some of the rest of us. I'm just a kid, and I like to play and have some fun. Out in the sunshine having friends Come and visit me and talk about Everything that's really wonderful and fine Play a little, get in trouble What a wonderful world What a wonderful world I know the earth, I feel, I feel the sky It lifts me and makes me strong to sing the planet's song. I'm just a kid, and I'm starting to get very scared. Of all our weapons, there's a chance we might have a war, and that would be the end of this wonderful world. The sky so red, my friends all dead. What a wonderful world. What a wonderful world. I know the earth, I feel, I feel the sky. It lifts me and makes me strong to sing the planet's song. Is it my turn? To sing the planet's song. So that song, that's it. <laughs> that's it. 
I'm just holding your hand. Give me a cue now. I'm supposed to say a few words. I want to speak about that song. It was written by Andy Christensen over in East Montpelier. Some of you might know him. He's been around for many years. I don't know if he's still here with us. I hope he is. He is. He is. Wonderful. Yeah. He wrote the song, and uh, it was part of one of the, one of the roles in the play. Uh, Jesse had come to me, and he said, I want this role in the play. I said, no, it's too hard. And he managed to convince Janet Hubbard Brown that he could play that role, and so he did. And he sang that song. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, actually, maybe Elijah sang that song in the actual show. I can't remember. But in any case, um, that song, I think, encapsulates some of, of, of what we're talking about here in terms of, of bringing in the voice of children and trying to create stories that can adequately counter the stories of fear and the, the drive to build up for war. And what Dad was saying earlier about this idea that um, children are something that people can relate to viscerally uh, in many different ways. So through the music, through having children sing songs that are not just kind of light and airy, but really try to show that the children are speaking with a full voice this was something that the Heart of the Mountain really accomplished um, as a musical. And throughout the process, we were working with the booklets and working with the, the foundation of the organization and using the musical to spread the message. And um, the small t-shirts, I just want to say, were such an important part of that organization as a symbol. Um, I was just speaking with Kathy Cadwell, who ran uh, Project Harmony, uh, which many of you may remember being a organiz an organization which still is going, actually, in many different ways, um, working with um, exchanges with Soviet Union at the time. She said immediately in her email to me, I'm so sorry I can't come, but I just remember those white t-shirts. I remember working with Glenn and remember the, that symbol and how powerful that was. And so I think we all knew when we created this musical that this was such a powerful experience. And we then created a, uh, a singing troupe called the Heart Troupe, which then traveled to Germany and to the Soviet Union and around the United States. Um, and for me, I became, I was always interested, I suppose, in performing as a young kid, but at the age of nine or whatever it was, this was when I, my first real play musical, and it was a play about something that I felt very strongly about. It was about activism. It was about changing the world. And for me, at that moment, I, that was like solidified in my being, that I wanted to be involved in theater and the arts, and I wanted it to be for social change. And so that kernel in, in, in my life, that seed, grew over time. And um, eventually, uh, after doing many different plays in high school, college, doing some professional theater throughout and also after college, I always knew that I wanted to see how could theater have a more, I don't know, a concrete impact on communities and on people, and I decided to travel and look at different opportunities at how people were using this. I heard that they had been using it in significant ways during the anti-apartheid movement, so I went to South Africa and had uh, an internship at an organization there. While I was in South Africa, um, we had a, a great friend of our organization uh, who translated this into German, um, Lutz van Dijk, who ended up in South Africa creating a home for children affected by HIV and AIDS with his partner and now husband, Perry, and all of their colleagues there. Um, and so, Dad decided to come to South Africa while I was there. They were opening their home. Archbishop, Archbishop Desmond, Desmond Tutu was there to um, open the home with them. And so we were all together there. And at that time, Dad said, I want to try to go to Rwanda. Well, a little bit before the trip, he said that. He said, I've, I'm motivated to go to Rwanda. Now, how did we get to that place, right? Um, when the nuclear freeze movement was sort of 
dying down a little bit when there were um, uh, when the Soviet Union started to crumble um, and shift, the emphasis of the organization also shifted. And so there were institutes um, for education of high school students in Vermont on issues related to the Holocaust and to racism. This became a major focus of the organization. And so during one of those, um, in 1997, this is when dad was brought the idea of looking at Rwanda in the context of talking about genocides, because the Rwandan uh, genocide uh, had taken place in 1994, <coughs> just shortly before then. So this became a part of dad's life and his mot motivation to go to Rwanda. So I went to South Africa, did my internship on theater. Dad went to South Africa and wanted to go to Rwanda. And then we ended up going to Rwanda and the video which you saw earlier is, is part of that, um, is one of the outcomes of that. So I ended up working with, we work, work with teachers and students on HIV prevention programs. And as a theater artist, I collaborated with existing theater programs in Rwanda. Check device at power, one turn on the device. If the power is not turned on, check the cable connection or select the connection guide button to learn how. Thank you. Connection guide button. And so we started a theater program with one high school, and then it ended up working with a total of 60 high schools at one point, but really like a core group of about 10 or maybe even less than that, like six schools for several years. And it became a very holistic program through which I feel like I tried to initiate things that were similar to the kinds of things I had learned from my father in terms of like, what are the kinds of symbols that one needs to create in order to get the message across? What are the kinds of methodologies that we need to use in order for the, for the, for the, um, for the message to get across? So we had students in the schools producing plays while they, were creating, while they were showing the plays, the audience would be talking the entire time. It was hard to tell, like, are they really getting the message of this play? So I decided to try to implement musical theater in the school and see how that would change things. This was back in the early you know, 2000s, 2003, 4, and Glee was, I don't know if you know that television show, it was not even like a part of American discussion at that point, I don't think. It was, musical theater was very new to people in Rwanda, from what I could tell. So we tried it out in the high school, and when the characters started to sing their thoughts and ideas on the stage, the audience did absolutely stop talking and paid attention to what was going on on the stage. And so we knew that we had a special um, technique that we, that we could use to, to shift things up. Um, and in addition to that, I tried to make the program as holistic as possible. Um, this is our little blog, which apparently is still around, which is amazing. I tried to make the program as holistic as possible. How can we support people living with HIV and AIDS and fight against the stigma associated with HIV and AIDS while also pre talking about HIV prevention so that the students and community members would would uh, protect themselves. This was a, two focuses. And so one of the methods that we used to um, try to support people living with HIV and AIDS was to connect with associations in the communities where the students were performing and to have those associations of people living with HIV AIDS become involved in the productions. Sometimes they were actually in the productions. Sometimes they made costumes for the productions. They made meals that we all shared together, which is a very important part of trying to break down the stigma that you can actually share food with someone who has HIV. And when the students went on tour to the neighboring villages with their play, we stayed in the homes of people living with HIV and AIDS. So this picture is actually a picture of me with a couple of students. We stayed in the home of a fellow named Isaac. And this is a way of showing the community members around the associations of people living with HIV AIDS that, that one can share a home, that one can be, um, don't have to be afraid. And these are the kinds of techniques that I would try to bring into my work. 
Um, so I raise them here as sort of connecting to the things that I learned throughout. Of course, music was a big part of it. Of course, theater was a big part of it, and that's something that I learned at a very young age as well. Um, and so I'll just give you a very quick um, sort of picture of the ending of this film, if we have time. We're at quarter to 11. Okay, so maybe we don't need it right now. You can watch it online. Um, it's uh, on Vimeo. It's too, so late, too late to show it. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, okay. And uh, so I'll just say one more word here about... Um, Elijah, you can say something about how we do this. And what I wanted to say is that while I was doing the program for, um, for on HIV prevention, I started to run this human rights youth program called Global Youth Connect. Um, that organization is no longer in existence. A long story there, it, during, during COVID basically, is when it stopped. Um, but uh, we had programs in Rwanda, Bosnia, and, uh, and when I came in, we started to do a program called Human Rights in the USA. Um, so that's a little bit of my story with relation to Rwanda. While we were doing our work in Rwanda, and Dad was doing other things, supporting small projects, educational projects, uh, Robin was supporting the associations of people living with HIV and AIDS with a community center we, we were able to construct um, and visited that center. While we were doing all of this work, we also did outreach in Vermont. And that was how we actually got to go back to our high school, Harvard Union High School, and we visited and did an assembly about our work and about Rwanda and about um, conflict resolution. And it was um, during that, that day, the first assembly, where Dad stood up and said, I think somebody in this room is going to go to Rwanda. And one young man in the audience stood up, or he came up afterwards and said, I'm, I'm going to Rwanda. And it was through that kernel that the program, which Tom Dean went on the first trip with and helped to nurture the program thereafter, and um, was born. And they went, I don't know, countless times to Rwanda, and um, they have actually, their program is still going, although I don't know if they're going to Rwanda right now. Um, let's see, I thought I had a picture of it. In any case, the program from Harwood, <coughs> While he's doing that, let me just mention that I, I've studied human development a lot and uh, had my eyes open a lot. And what I want to say is that music for human beings precedes language. Music starts in the womb with the beat of the drum. And the beat of the drum is in almost every song any human being ever sings. It's especially in the little ones that are sung to children when they're rocking and so on and when they're moving back and forth. So rhythm and sound exist for humans prior to language, and that's one of the reasons that music can be so powerful. Yeah. Great, so yeah, and that program, um, thank you for that, Dad. I think yeah. that's a great ending. Um, we'll have some discussion, and Elijah will talk maybe a little bit about education, and um, this is just a picture of uh, something that a fundraiser that the Harvard Union Troop good. You've got the picture of Vermont, land of green, the Green Mountains, and you've got the uh, ge geographic uh, image of Rwanda, the land of a thousand hills. Uh, a nice connection there, and it was really nurtured um, over many years by great teachers, uh, including, I think Kathy Cattle was also involved with that sometimes, mm -hmm. with Steve Rand. And Steve Rand is the main, uh, you folks planted the seeds. I took the first four students. Well, first of all, the young man that went the history department got together and said, we're going to fund this guy to go to Rwanda. I don't know if I'm allowed to use his name or not. I'll just use his first name. His name was Troy. And he gave a presentation while he was in Rwanda, communicated with us. We had an assembly and just told what was happening. It happened to be on Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday when he did, the, uh, did this assembly and just hooked several students and said, I want to go too. And so the following year, I took four, happened to be four young ladies, and we, we went to Rwanda for uh, what, 10 days during the winter vacation. You know, winter vacation, uh, the way the schools are arranged, we do, used winter vacation plus other a week. So we went for about 14 days, if you remember correct, correctly, Jess, and we went to the home that you folks had in, in Rwanda. And so that's when it began. And that, those were the seeds. We were just, we're, you know, studying the, the, the genocide and what had happened there. 
and the students became involved in uh, human conflict, obviously. Where, what, where did this come from? What caused this? And so we, we uh, went. Since that time, that was just the seeds. My colleague, uh, Steve Rand, has taken that program and it's blossomed. Students are still going there. There's been hundreds of students have gone to Rwanda from Harwood. Hmm. Life-changing experiment, experience, excuse me, experience. And it's been wonderful. He's taken it far beyond anything I could have ever imagined. He's done a tremendous job. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'd, I'd really love to open the, the, it up for more conversations, reactions, and responses and, and questions, because a lot has been shared, Robin. So I was thinking some back and forth, because we're planning to end at 11, right? Yeah. Well, I think we can go over 11. I don't think anything's going to kick us out. But I think okay. you haven't really spoken conversation about conversation. your work as a educator and uh, principal at uh, Randall High School and your application to be Secretary of Education here in Vermont, which will yeah. probably be eliminated if a certain um, public education will be eliminated. Man gets elected President of the United States. But um, yeah, I tell us, I mean, education is so fraught right now. I mean, there are forces saying take all these books out of the library. Did you have to deal with those kind of folks in, in Randall? Similar pressures, maybe different, different topics at the time. So while Jesse and, Jesse and, and Dad were, were carving their path, creating new institutions to do the work they thought was needed in the world, I, I found a bit, a bit more of a home in traditional institutions, in, in public schools, um, first in New York City, and then later, and then later came back to Vermont. So I was an English teacher for five years, and then had the good fortune to help start a school called the James Baldwin School in New York City. And that school's still around. Both of those schools are, are still around. Um, I was the founding principal there at Baldwin for six years before coming to to, to Vermont, and got and and um, then was principal at Randolph Union for for ten years, working with people like Dana and uh, other community members that are here in this space. And I largely saw. Um, if if I could try to like summarize my approach to schooling and school reform, it's that the, orient the structures, the routines, the habits of the institution, the curriculum of the classroom, what we're talking about and how we talk about it needs to be oriented towards the needs of the children, the needs of their families, the needs of the broader community, and out we go. Check device power. One turn on the device. If the power is not... The curriculum needs to be oriented towards the, the, the individual needs of, of the children and the intersectional needs of the society, the community, and the, the broader world. Um, and uh, that's, not an, uh, that's not a light lift for any educator, um, and, and no, matter what, at a, no matter what time, and it's particularly challenging right now to... Uh, to, to posit that the personal and the political need to be a part of our work, starting with the communities where we are right, right now. Um, and so what, what that largely involves is creating adult meeting and learning spaces, classroom meeting and learning spaces, and broader community spaces that can hold personal stories and historical facts and can help us see how um, when our personal stories intersect, what may feel like a very individual struggle actually becomes a, a political intersection. Because if you share your story and I share my story and we see that they intersect, then all of a sudden our stories are shaped by common circumstances. They have something in common. That makes our stories have a political context. And so we can now turn our gaze towards the policies that shape our lives, that are made by the people who we, who we elect and the people who we don't elect and we can turn our attention to power and how power works to the degree that it's shaping our individual stories. That, that's a bit of my approach in terms of the like, curriculum well, can, can you just uh, amplify a little bit in terms of your application to be Secretary of Education? What, what is yes. that job? How did Governor Scott <laughs> interpret it and then decide to choose someone from out of the state who is an expert in, in charter schools. And so that's what we have right now is a woman, uh, I think it's not, she has to go through another few steps to actually be appointed, but she's the Secretary of Education here in Vermont now. And what does that mean? 
<laughs> so after transitioning from Randolph Union, I joined the Upper Valley Educators Institute, which works across Vermont and New Hampshire. It's a small graduate school of education that certifies teachers and certifies school administrators. I'm the director of the administrator leadership program. And that helped me see the public school landscape from a much broader vantage point, because I'm visiting schools all over the region and getting to know the leaders of those schools. Um, so after three years of doing that work, I was sitting at a, a sports game with a, with, a form, with, a, with a current high school principal, and he, sometimes had, he somehow had some maybe inside scoop on who the candidates were for the Secretary of Education position, and he was lamenting that there wasn't anyone from the field, as far as he knew it, from, from Vermont, from Vermont schools that was putting their hat in the ring. And I thought, oh, God. All right, I'll, I'll see what happens. So I threw my hat in the ring. And then after about six or seven months of um, deliberations through the State Board of Education and the governor's team, I was one of the three finalists and really grateful to have been part of that process and, and to step back and thought a lot about public education policy in our state and the challenges that we're facing. I wasn't chosen, obviously, to be the, the secretary, um, but I was excited about the work because I feel so connected to so many schools and so many educators around the state having stepped out of my work at Randolph Union and working for UVEI, St. Mike's, the Vermont Higher Education Collaborative, the idea of being able to jump into some of the real sticky, thorny challenges that our educators are facing right now and to be there with them in that work, Robin, was super exciting for me. So um, obviously the governor and his team had different, thought that it wasn't a match. So here we are now. <laughs> I'm going to advocate for you if that opportunity comes up. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think it'd be really great to hear what reactions and responses and questions are in the in the room, Robin. And you could moderate that for us, or yeah. I could well, do that. And it, I see a hand up. It's okay. Over there. Great. Well, since the Senate failed to confirm her as secretary, and then the governor immediately reappointed her as interim secretary, and I understand there has been legal action um, filed against that decision. Does, does that open a pathway for you? And are you trying to move forward on a pathway such as that? I don't, I don't know if it opens any pathway for other, other candidates. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm super engaged right now with the people that I'm working with now and the people that are in my, in my program. So that's, that's really my focus right now. Do you have a sense that uh, Governor Scott really is joining Chris Sununu and all these other somewhat moderate, somewhat not so moderate Republicans to dismantle public education, which is, of course, a major goal of, you know, on the national level of the Christian nationalists and all kinds of people? I don't have a sense. I don't have a sense. You know, so you've, you've, heard, you've heard a lot. There are probably lots of intersections with your own lives and interests. Are there, are there questions that you have? Are there stories that any of you would like to share? Um, are there reflections about that, that, that you'd like to offer into the space here that Jesse or Dad or Robin or I or others could respond to? I'd like to thank you. I haven't even heard of you that I know of. I probably have, but it fell out of my ears some, some time ago. You know, what a remarkable family. What a remarkable legacy. Vermont born and raised, at least. <coughs> I can't believe you were that small. <laughs> and anyway, oh my God. But it's lovely, you know, homegrown. Speaking of, sm speaking of small, if I can just add something quickly. I was reading recently a little bit that Buckminster Fuller, a dropout from Harvard, by the way, that he, uh, wrote, and one of his concepts, he had been in the Navy, I believe, was called the trim tab. Trim tab, trim tab, T-A-B, trim tab. It, it's a little trimming on a big rudder. So it's a small rudder on a big rudder, which the big rudder won't turn if the small rudder doesn't cause the flow to begin to change. That's what helps the big rudder turn. And what Bucky Fuller said is, tell everybody that each one is a trim tab. We're all trim tabs in his room. I don't know if you like water or not, but. <laughs> yeah, any other questions or comments? 
We should mention a girl that you might want to check on through, um, what is that? You can go up on, online on what? YouTube? YouTube. Could be. YouTube, what, yes. A girl? A girl named Valentina. It is on YouTube a uh, frontline BBC special on a girl named Valentina. It's called Valentina's Nightmare. And if you'd like to learn something about what was happening in Rwanda at the time of the genocide and about this girl because she became a central focus for us and for the, and for the Harwood people when they came to Rwanda to meet her and talk with her. She had been in a church with her family when the slaughtering took place in eastern Rwanda and she had been pulled out of the church by one of her neighbors and she had been hit a few times with a machete and uh, she survived that. It was raining, she says, mud all around. She crawled back in the church and went to a corner where she stayed for 43 days. 43 days in that church full of corpses and Valentina survived. We met a man who said he picked her up. That was uh, Tom uh, Indahiro. He said, he, I picked her up in my coat and I had to keep looking to see if she was there. She was so light. She had had nothing to eat. Maybe she said she'd never drank anything, but we think she must have had rainwater or something in the church otherwise. But what happened is that people came by the church. They saw all the dead people. They didn't bother going in. They just assumed everybody was dead. And so she just sat there and sat there and sat there for 43 days. She's a healthy young woman now. She has all the fingers chopped off of one hand, and she wants to keep it that way because people notice it, and she can say, this is what happened to me. And she wow. can do everything with that. She has two children. She lives in Texas. Wow, what a great story. Yeah. There was a question over here. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. Um, I'm just hearing so many parallels with group, uh, maybe the magnitude of the sort of existential threat and we go to war now with climate crisis and climate change that feels so scary and so, uh, yeah, just thinking of my daughter and how we can provide the stories and symbols for children now about loving our planet and loving our earth and um, I'm, a, I'm a writer and I think about that a lot and I just wondered as, as a parent um, how, yeah, if there feel like there are parallels with the climate crisis and how you've spoken to children about that. And Is there a question? I was just curious if there are symbols and stories they're working with around climate change and climate crisis um, for children now. At, at, um, at Randolph Union, and Dana taught a course in this, in this program, we created a, a learning space at the school called the Project Based Learning Lab. And the mandate of that learning lab was to offer year-long electives to high school students focused on contemporary challenges and collaborative solutions. And there were several years, and perhaps they're still happening, where teachers would step in and offer a course that was focused on the climate crisis. And then they would work with young people to see um, who can we collaborate with to take some steps towards addressing the challenge? And so there's no particular maybe symbol or story there, Chelsea, but the idea being that when, uh, when, 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 when the crisis seems insurmountable and yet locking arms with others and in solidarity, we can take a step in the right direction, it feels less oppressive. And I think that's really important for young people today to have a sense of agency. Um, and that they can be the trim trap, perhaps, in steering trim, yeah. this ship in a better direction. Um, but again, there needs to be support from school administrators, from educators, and from the wider community to open up those spaces for learning and contemporary problem solving in our, in our schools. Um, but it can happen there. And just one musing on that. If you think about parallel to the heart of the mountain with the nuclear freeze movement, if children were doing a musical about climate change right now, what would be the words being put into their, what would, what would the writing be for them? What would the songs be about? Would it be something simple? Would it be something that talks about literally how um, 
ash is covering the glaciers and therefore um, they are absorbing heat and they are heating up and they are melting very fast. And are these children going to speak like that? And you know, some children won't want to, but some children will be able to. And that could be something that could move people because when you see young people talking about the true feedback loops that are happening, right, and how this is going to impact not just them, but even us, because 2050 is right around the corner, right? Mm -hmm. That, those are the kinds of things I think that could really move society. I don't know about other children. <laughs> No, you're first. No, I, I was something in the. No, I, I like the. Uh, I'm a social worker, and narrative therapy is something I learned early with some of the early people in the 90s, and stories, telling stories, and that's how people heal by knowing in relationships in their families. They talk it through. They learn different ways to be and how to get healthy. But I, I like the image of the baby's uh, um, t-shirt. Shirt. A woman came out, a young woman, who I think is a climate activist, came out to one of our demonstrations and it was about Gaza. And she brought a little shirt of a child on a, on a, on a, a hanger, like you hang it in the closet, and put it on next to us while we were just holding up a sign, genocide. And the image really was of children and families in Gaza who were being blown up. And, and, and when you see those people, you see old pictures of, or new pictures of them at weddings or funerals or with their families or whatever ceremonies they have, and they're alive and, and well, and they, and they continue to be alive and well. But having that little shirt makes them continue to be alive and well, not just blown up. So it's a very nice thing. I appreciate that, you know. Thank you. Maybe you taught her that. I don't know. <laughs> Dr. Spock came to Montpelier one time and he, uh, we had dinner with him at a, a friend's house and he spoke uh, at one of the venues in, in Montpelier and I re have a picture somewhere. I threw a lot of things out and I donated things to a, to a special uh, museum, but he held up that little shirt. He said that, that this is what it's about. Because a lot of people didn't believe what Dr. Spock was saying about children, but he was, a, he was an authority. I have one more thing I want to add quickly, which is that I'm about to uh, depart. Almost all of my friends are dead. Robin's one of the few close friends. You're three months older than I am. You're an old person. I'm getting there. Uh, often people say, well, it's a week. You have a week to live. And for me, it's Friday night. And uh, I don't know if I'll die on uh, Saturday or Sunday, but it's Friday night. So I keep saying to myself, what about my grandboys? What about Elijah's two boys? What, you know, what about your child? And I say to myself, maybe there are things happening that we are not controlling as much as we try to control because that we have to control things. And I got to thinking about elephants and how the elephants have the the grand old female who has all the knowledge, who can lead the family, she does what women do, she manages the entire family, which is what women are able to do better than men. And the bull elephants are kicked out when they start acting up as adolescents. I believe, and many of us watch the Olympics, that men and women, but especially men, can put a lot of their bloodthirstiness and dangerousness into athletics. And if you watch athletics, you see battles taking place. It's a form of play. Culture is based on play. And on the other side, I think we must have more women who are family-oriented in positions of political power. And I think maybe Mother Nature is doing that in a way that we may not even be fully aware. Just a thought about the elephants. Yeah. All right, well, are there... One more comment from Dana. One more comment? Yeah. No, I, I had a two-part reflection comment um, that had to do with um, two people that spoke. The 
First thing, I think it's really important to bring um, student voice into everything we do. And Elijah talked a little bit about um, the PBL and how we had a student-led um, classes. One was climate change. It was actually the only letter I got in my personal file from Elijah for walking out with the students um, um, to protest their voice and um, how scared they are. And it's really hard for the adults to stop talking and start listening. Um, and that gets muddied, political. So everything they fight for always turns into political and it turns into us and doctoring and it turns into us grooming when really it is their voice that, that is um, screaming for um, the right to have a future. Um, and then the other comment I wanted to say was throughout this whole thing, thank you for coming and talking. It was really nice to um, hear, but we're living a lot in the past and I want to know what we could do right now. You mentioned Gaza and that's what the elephant in the room is. We're talking about these genocides and these nuclear bombings and I think of Sudan and I think of Colombia and I think of our border and what we're doing to our migrant children that just want a safe place. And how do we bring your work to um, today and how do we move forward and reach out to Ballant and which I don't have a lot of hope in our in our govern in our government. Um, but I do have a lot of hope in our youth and um, I hope that we have more of these conversations um, throughout the whole state. Um, and it does move throughout the whole country and we do um, somehow plant seeds so it moves throughout the whole world and that's the only way to do anything really. So thank you for bringing that to Rochester today. Yeah. So there is a, a peace movement, an active peace movement here with Duncan and, and uh, Nancy and myself and uh, Jerome called Vermont Peace Anti-War Coalition. And uh, so look that up and join us and, uh, and sign on to the resolution relating to um, nuclear weapons and Becca Ballant and hoping that she will sign it. Resolution 77 in the House. Mm -hmm. So if there are no other questions, let's just thank these three wonderful men and their, their family and their support family of uh, the wider support. And uh, it's really been moving to hear the, all of you. And you're also articulate. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. I, I just want to also mention that I think, Robin, you've also worked a lot on issues related to um, Central Africa and um, to Congo. the Congo. And this is not a, um, a cut and dry situation. The genocide that we referred to earlier in our conversation is uh, now officially called the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Um, so you may see that. And i um, happy to answer many more questions about that region and the complexity of that region um, because uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of suffering that continues. Um, and it's based on a lot of the things that were happening even, you know, potentially while we were in Rwanda. Um, it's a very, very complex situation. And um, yes, just wanted to let you know that we're happy mm -hmm. to answer. Right. And stay engaged on that. Thank you. Thank you all of them. Oh, another comment. Um, well, one, the banking country where we are was thousands and thousands of years old. I mean, most of the history here is banking. You know, women were always in charge. Men carried what they carry on them. Women, if you have to talk about owning things, which is not common in the old days, but in the white world, um, if it's a matter of ownership, women owned everything, were responsible for everything. And men uh, carried what they carried with them. But more importantly, children voted from the moment they were conceived, if not born. They're fully enfranchised. Now, some children want to be children like children are encouraged to be today, which is basically not grown-ups on the male side until they're like in their 90s or whatever. <laughs> But uh, honestly, um, the most profound example of that capacity of children to lead and guide us, to echo what this uh, lady just said to us, 
at the beginning of, of the first Gulf War, uh, Paul Runt from, and I were going up and doing veterans gatherings for electives up at North Country Union High School. And, and it's a working people's backwoods rural, half the people are Beneke or native. And these um, electives were full of people wearing uniforms. They were in junior ROTC and they were headed. Half the kids in this school were graduating and going into the military. Within a year when we got back there, because of the growing internet and communication between children, just talking to themselves, not just listening to Paul and I say, whatever you do, don't go to war for any reason. There's just no way. Peter, Paul, Mary are right. You know, where are all the flowers going? Don't go to war for any reason. And they had all taught each other that this was essential. In the year we were back talking, and the war was over, essentially, but the carnage had already rippled back through the community. They had taken the initiative. And I find that that's true even now today, that the hope being in the hands of the children is precisely where we are. And there are so many children that I know who have chosen not to go to war or not to feed the, the, the war machine or, the, or all the other machines that, that feed the genocide. Yeah, and they are, they are uh, in charge of so many of these uh, climate act action yeah. protests uh, around the country. Good. Well, good. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, I uh, think we've had a very fruitful conversation.